All right, guys, so taking a look here at the age of progressives. <clears throat> As we emerge out of the Gilded Age, we're starting to see many American citizens recognize the problems of the growing industrialization, the rapid uh, expansion in population when it comes to immigrants, and the overburdened growing cities that are not able to grow at the necessary rate to accommodate the growing population and growing industry. So this becomes known as the progressive era. So it's not that the Gilded Age happened and then the progressive age happened, they're actually happening simultaneously. Um, the progressives are those who are trying to make progress, who are trying to make change and positive attributes to American society. There are four main goals of the progressives. One was to protect the social welfare of American citizens. The other was to promote a moral improvement, so trying to fix some of the um, morals and standards of American citizens. The third was to create economic reform, so maybe equal opportunity when it comes to economics, as well as addressing some of the labor issues. The fourth is fostering efficiency. What's going to make us run the best way possible? Even when it comes to progressive, where can they put their efforts that's going to trickle out into other area, problem areas of American society? So where can they get the most bang for their buck? Um, this is, you know, the reinforcement of the progressive era is it's a government by the people. So the people have to become involved. They can't just simply rely on the government to try to address and fix all of the problems. It's going to take efforts of individuals and small organizations to try to bring about this social change. So some examples of protecting the social welfare, we've already talked about before, but providing to those who are in need. So the social gospel movement, as many people sought to the church um, to establish their moral standards, many felt that you could seek salvation by providing aid to the poor or providing services. So there was the YMCA, which is a local community center that would provide services to those who are in need. The Salvation Army, which still exists today, that took in resources and materials to provide for those who could not provide for themselves. There was also the Settlement House movement. Jane Addams created the first settlement house um, in Chicago with Hall House. But then pictured here is Florence Kelly, who's also going to be an advocate for improving the lives of women and children. She felt if there were more opportunities and support for mothers to be able to raise their children, that the children would not feel compelled to have to go to work with their mother and or have to work to help provide for the family, that the children could focus on their education and help their family get out of the poverty situation that they found themselves in. Some examples of promoting the moral improvement, um, we see a rise of the temperance movement again, so the idea of prohibition, which is the banning of alcohol. We talked about the temperance movement from the early reform movement in the early to mid-1800s, just before the Civil War. Um, that's going to pick back up in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. Uh, the Women Christians Temperance Union is going to be established by Francis Willard. They want to work to prohibit uh, the consumption and making of alcohol. They feel alcohol is the root to problems for immigrants, that they're wasting money on alcohol. If alcohol was not available, that money may go towards better resources. Um, it also felt that they would help women and children, that if their husbands and fathers were not drinking or would feel compelled to drink, that that would be more support for the family home life. Another organization besides the Women Christian Temperance Union will also be the Anti-Saloon League. And so these organizations were mostly led by women, as many of the progressives is going to be led by women. Um, they look to creating pamphlets, creating um, luncheons and stuff to try to raise, to raise awareness for their situation. But some, like Carrie Nation, take her little hatchet into the saloons and start um, attacking the bottles to leave an impact, to make a message. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have in creating the economic reform. So we see the rise of socialism. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there are many citizens who did not um, support the idea of capitalism. They felt capitalism only made the rich richer and the poor poor. Socialism was um, encouraged by a person by the name of Eugene V. Debs. Uh, Eugene Debs felt that you know, there should be equal distribution of resources amongst the workers, that that would encourage everybody to work and everyone to have a fair standard of life. Other members who look for reform, um, particularly in industries and working conditions, were muckrakers. 
Muckrakers were journalists who wrote about the corrupt side of business and public life. So they wanted to draw the attention to the masses of some of the major social problems and economic problems of American society. Some notable muckrakers are Ida uh, M. Tarbell. Ida Tarbell um, took it upon herself to expose the problem of monopolies. Her particular target was um, John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company. And so through her publications and through the creation of political cartoons, it's going to bring about the um, dismantling of the Standard Oil Company to break up that trust. Another notable muckraker who we'll talk about a little bit more during the Teddy Roosevelt administration is Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair wrote a novel called The Jungle. His intent with this was to show the, dis, um, to show the difficulties of immigrant life coming into America. But what people really took away from this book was his exposure of the unsanitary uh, practices of the meatpacking industry and the impact that that was having on the American society who was consuming the meat from those industries. The last component of the goals of the progressive era was fostering the essence of um, efficiency. So making the country run in the most efficient way as possible. So they wanted to instill faith in experts and scientific principles. So if they were experts who had ideas to make society and the workplace more efficient, then those are the models that we should go with. So for example, we see here Henry Ford's um, assembly line okay, and the approach to mass production, to increase production, to make things more affordable for the American citizens. So his assembly line, where you are tasked with one particular job and you keep repeating that job over and over on the assembly line. This reduced the workday to eight hours uh, because you are manufacturing, you're doing the same job over and over. And this also enabled him to pay his workers more because the more that he produced, the more he could sell, which was more revenue in his pocket. And he in turn turned that over to his citizens or to his employees. Now, the one event that is really going to bring about the progressive era, that's going to bring a light um, to the problems of society, was the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire that took place in New York City. Um, the tri Triangle Shirtwaist Fire was very similar to many textile mills. Um, there was a lot of sewing machines, mostly all female employees. Um, the issue was that it was um, at the top of the building, so there was second and third story floors. Um, where the women were manufacturing um, shirtwaist, which is essentially just a standard uh, white blouse um, that most Americans, most um, men and women would wear. Um, the problem came when the employers wanted to make sure that the women weren't skipping out on their work or leaving early, that they would lock the women in on the floor. So it, they would lock them in from the outside, So which means women could not get out of the work situation or the work environment until their managers came to unlock the doors with the change and shift. The problem is, is a fire broke out um, within the factory, and so women were stuck inside this burning building and they had no fire escapes at the windows to be able to get out of the building since the doors were locked. So women had two choices. They could either stay in the building and burn to death or they could jump from the windows and hope that they survived the fall, which many did not. So this incident got a lot of publication in newspapers across New York City and an outcry amongst American citizens about the treatment of these women, the fact that they were locked in, that they couldn't leave, and that they had to jump to their desks to try to be able to survive from this fire. It also brought about regulation, that there should be fire codes, that there should be fire escapes at the windows, that doors shouldn't be locked. And so this is the first instance where business owners were held accountable for the working conditions that they were putting their employees through. And so this is gonna pave the way for other reforms to take place. One such area is local government. So we have the establishment of city commissions. Talking about that efficiency, wanting experts to be able to create the plans. Well, they needed cities to run efficiently. They needed sanitation commissions. They needed police commissions and fire commissions um, who could all coordinate to have the city run um, in the most efficient manner. So they were experts. Oftentimes they brought these experts from outside the city. They wanted someone who is not affiliated with any political group or a political machine who could objectively look at the situation in the city and find the best way to be able to run it. Um, so they're not involved in the political machines. Another example are the city managers. 
So the city managers are appointed by a city council, a group of individuals that run the city's departments. And so the manager may manage the police department or may manage the fire department or manage the sanitation commission. So both of those were to address the growing concern of the political machines, people like William Boss Tweed, who were able to manipulate and control local politics to their advantage. Another concern was the working conditions of children. Children were more prone to accidents because of fatigue. They were working just as many hours as adults, anywhere from 12 to 16 hour days. Um, there was concern that these children should be in school. They should be learning. Um, they're just creating a vicious cycle of poverty, having children work. They're never going to get the education to go beyond the unskilled jobs that they're currently hired to um, complete. So the National Child Labor Committee is going to be established. And they get the Keating Owing Act in 1916, which is going to prohibit the transportation of any goods produced across state lines um, that were produced by child labor. There's not going to be a national child labor law. There are limitations. There are, you know, children are not supposed to be at this time 14 years or older. Um, children are not supposed to work more than eight hours a day. The problem is, is that uh, many employers could buy off officials who are looking for child labor. The other problem is, is children lied. Children needed to work. Their families needed the money to survive. So with that stipulation of the age of 14, oftentimes they would lie about how old they were or they'd lie about how many hours that they were working. So trying to address the issue of child labor was extremely difficult. Trying to reform the election process. This is trying to tackle the issue of the political machines. You know, at this time, um, voting was out in the open. You did not have secret ballots, even when it came to legislation. So individuals could see who you were voting for in regards to representation, but also what laws you were supporting. And so they wanted to bring the government back to the people, to hear the voice of the people, not to hear the voice of the political machines who had influence over the people. So one such reform is the initiative. This is where bills or laws, so a bill is a piece of legislation that has not been signed into action yet, are originated by the people rather than the lawmakers. So people can, quote, take the initiative. They can take the action to propose a bill, to propose a law, and put it on the ballot for the rest of the community to vote on. They did not have to rely on their lawmakers to do this. Another reform was a referendum. So before a law could go into action, let's say lawmakers did make a law or they wanted to change a law, before they could put it into effect, they had to put it on the ballot to allow the people to vote okay, on that piece of legislation to get their opinion. So for example, if the state, Virginia state legislature wants to change the driving age from 16 to 18, before they could put that into effect, they have to put that law on the ballot for American citizens or Virginian citizens particularly, excuse me, um, to vote on to decide whether or not they want to support that law. That is a referendum. A third reform to elections was the process of a recall. This would enable voters to hold a emergency election to decide to remove a public official who's been elected um, from office if they do not seem to be doing their job, okay, or holding up the terms of the agreement on which they were elected. So this could apply to city managers, this could apply to city commissioners, but also local government and city council members. So this is a way for the people to kind of keep a check on the elected representatives who are supposed to represent them in local government and local legislature. At a national level, we will see another amendment added to the Constitution. The 17th Amendment um, is going to address the issue of U.S. Senators to be elected by the people. Under the Constitution, back when it was created, uh, remember that the Founding Fathers didn't necessarily trust the masses. So the people could elect the House of Representative members, who are members of the lower house, but the state legislatures would be the ones to elect U.S. Senators. Well, as time had progressed, people started to trust the masses. They felt that the public should be able to elect their representatives, even at the national level. This also was to combat against the party bosses and the wealthy business owners 
who were able to influence the state legislatures in electing national senators um, that would be um, supportive of their business measures or of their political ring. So the 17th Amendment is going to push for and is going to be created where um, the people now vote for their senators. So it is a direct election by the people, not through state legislatures that could be influenced by outside parties. And so this will be passed in 1913. Women and reform were quite significant. Uh, women are going to be striving for the role of voting. We talked about the suffrage movement with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott before the Civil War. The Civil War put the suffrage movement on hold, but after the Civil War, into the late 1800s and into the turn of the 20th century, the suffrage movement is going to pick up again. So Nassau, which is the National American Women's Suffrage Association, is going to be the largest suffrage organization in the United States. Um, it was founded by Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony also worked with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, so that's how the two groups were going to be bridged together. There were three uh, parts to the women's strategy to be able to get the right to vote. One was to go to the state level. If they could convince state legislatures to grant women the right to vote within their state, um, then they felt that eventually if they got enough states that they would be able to get a national um, representation for women to be able to vote at a national level. The first state to give women the right to vote was the state of Wyoming in 1869. Now, before you think Wyoming is this great progressive state that cared about the concern of women, remember that under the Northwest Ordinance, okay, to become a state, you had to have 60,000 residents who were able to vote. Well, Wyoming was a very rural, um, unpopulated territory. And so they had to grant women the right to vote so that they could get the 60,000 numbers that they needed to be able to become a state. And so that is why you see like Utah, Colorado, and Idaho, those are underpopulated states who need that larger voting population to have a voice in the government. So it's not that, you know, many of them may have seen that women were able to vote and should have a voice, but it also served their political needs at the national level to give women the right to vote. <laughs> The second part to the strategy was to take court cases. So they were going to argue that women not having the right to vote was a violation of the 14th Amendment. That citizenship rights to men and women should be applied the same. And so as equal citizens under the United States, they should also have the equal opportunity to vote. The third was to push for a national constitutional amendment. And there's going to be some arguments within the suffrage movement between Nassau and another group, the National Women's Party, about how much they should push at the national level for women to get the right to vote. The 19th Amendment will be passed in 1919. So this comes after World War I. It was actually a lot of the efforts by women during World War I that's going to change public opinion about women having the right to vote. Um, the amendment was finally won narrowly um, by a vote from a vote in Tennessee. Um, a young Tennessee senator was about to vote against women getting the right to vote until he got a telegram from his mother telling him to be a good lad and to give women the right to vote. And so his vote is going to be the vote that swung in favor to get them the necessary percentage to be able to ratify um, the 19th Amendment. So in 1920 is when women will get the right to vote. And that came 72 years after the Seneca Falls Convention, where women started to strive for equal rights in American society. So it's going to take some time. All right, so now we're going to start to take a look at who were our presidents. We haven't talked a lot about presidents during the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age was primarily dominated by those captains of industry. But at the turn of the 20th century, we will see um, some prestige brought back to the executive branch. And none other than Teddy Roosevelt is going to bring back that prestige and power to the executive branch. Um, he served as vice president to uh, previous president William McKinley in 1900. William McKinley was an imperialist. We'll be talking about the rise of imperialism. He was assassinated six months into his second term, which Teddy Roosevelt being his vice president is going to be sworn in as president. At the time, he is going to be the youngest president. And he wasn't very popular, even amongst senators and other members of Congress. 
Um, they never thought that he would ever become president, but he was a popular enough to help win votes for William McKinley. William McKinley. So upon his assassination, Teddy Roosevelt being sworn in as president, had a lot in Congress feeling a little leery because Teddy Roosevelt was quite outspoken. Um, he's going to strengthen the powers of the executive branch. He saw his position as president as his bully pulpit, meaning that he could try to influence news, um, media publications, as well as legislation as president of the United States. His domestic policy, so like his campaign policy for the United States, was a square deal. Um, he felt that you know a square deal would mean equal on all sides for all. So it included reform legislation. He did believe in hard work, but he also believed in equality for others. And one of his major targets is breaking up the monopolies. So his trust busting. He gets the nickname as a trust buster. Um, Roosevelt was a businessman, and he didn't feel that the government should regulate every aspect of business, but that the government should have a hand. He also didn't believe that all trusts were harmful. If a trust was reasonable and their prices and quantity in the market, he would leave them alone. Um, he says, you know, a good trust was conscience, uh, had a conscience. You know, they were aware that they couldn't gouge their customers, that they couldn't um, expect too much from the economy while bad trusts were greedy and abused their position in public. And those are the trusts that he went after. Um, he started to file suits. He actually started to enforce the Sherman Antitrust Act. And the first one that he was able to win was against the railroads in 1902. After that, he's going to file 44 other antitrust suits while he is in office. Another area that Roosevelt dealt with was the meat industry in Chicago. So as I mentioned before, Upton Sinclair's novel, um, The Jungle, had exposed the disgusting environment of the meat packing industry. I mean, discovering that you know the pale blue milk was milk that was doctored with formaldehyde. Mind you, formaldehyde is a chemical to preserve dead bodies. Um, was being sold to the public. Um, poisoned meat. Um, there were rats and stuff, you know, rat poison and uh, rat droppings and <clears throat> scraps and stuff that had been fallen on the floor. People had spat on, you know, just diseased meat was being thrown into hoppers, rope, other resources that were being sold to the American public. It was quite disgusting and it actually caused Teddy Roosevelt to become a vegetarian for quite some time. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a little skeptical of Upton Sinclair's book. He thought maybe Upton Sinclair was exa exaggerating the situation to be able to sell books. So he led an investigation. You know, he's going to have the U.S. government inspect the meatpacking industry of Chicago. And what he discovered disgusted him, that Upton Sinclair had not exaggerated, that he had spoken true of many of the disgusting habits within those industries. So this is going to bring about two pieces of legislation. One was the Meat Inspection Act that was established in 1906. Um, this dictated that there had to be a strict cleanliness order to the production of meat, um, and that meat had to be federally inspected. And any inspection or any meat deemed unworthy could not be sold to the American public. There's also the Pure Food and Drug Act, or the FDA, which still exists today. That was also established in 1906. Um, this halted the sale of contaminated food and medicines. Um, this is where, you know, again, that formaldehyde milk is not going to be able to be sold. They also had to start to list their ingredients. So this is the beginning of where you had to be true to, you know, saying what the medicine could do or what was in the food product. You could not exaggerate claims. You couldn't say that this medicine was a cure-all when really it was just sugar water. You know, put into a bottle. You had to list the specific ingredients that were in the products that were being sold and consumed by American society. Teddy Roosevelt is also going to be one of our first conservationists. Um, he saw wilderness um, as something that needed to be protected, um, that we are starting to exhaust some of our natural resources as we are trying to develop our growing industries. Teddy Roosevelt himself liked to be out in nature. So he created the Newlands Act, which allowed to the government to sell land um, and with money pay for irrigation um, within some of the regions, particularly like the Great Plains. He saved 125 million acres of forest to create the National Park Service. 
um, that is going to be regulated by the government to try to protect those lands and to protect the overproduction of lumbering or development of land. He also um, wanted people to be more aware of their own use of resources. So some um, conservationist organizations like the Sierra Club are going to be established. He made a head department, um, Gifford Pinchot is going to be the head of the conservation movement. And these are the early works. The Environmental Protection Agency is not going to come for quite some time, but this is the early works of the conservation movement of the U.S. Now, Teddy Roosevelt is going to go to tradition. He served two terms as president and was extremely popular amongst progressives. He had a very charismatic, flamboyant um, personality. I mean, he was a person that um, was noticed by everybody and was quite popular by the American public. But bowing to tradition, Teddy Roosevelt refused to run for a third term. Um, he is going to pass the buck to his uh, vice president, his candidate of choice, William Howard Taft. The problem is, is William Howard Taft really didn't want to be um, president. And sorry, uh, he wasn't Roosevelt's vice president, excuse me. He was his secretary of war um, when it came to his position within the government. William Taft um, was a lawyer and had a law background. Uh, he was handpicked by Roosevelt. Roosevelt felt that he was progressive enough and would continue with Roosevelt's um, agenda that he had established with the square deal. But again, like I said, Taft never wanted the job. He didn't like being in the spotlight. He was not as charismatic as Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and so he's not going to be as popular and actually going to be considered a disappointment to Roosevelt. But because he had the support of Teddy Roosevelt and his backing, he easily won against William Jennings Bryan. Uh, Taft was a large man. You know, yes, it's a little funny joke. Taft did get stuck in a tub in the White House. He had to have help to pry him out of the tub. Um, he was six feet tall, about 350 pounds. So he was a large man. He just didn't have the personality to go with it. Taft is heavily criticized by Roosevelt. Many people felt Taft wasn't progressive enough. Um, but he's actually going to be far more effective in breaking up monopolies than Teddy Roosevelt was. Um, so Roosevelt, in seven and a half years, broke up 44 trusts. Taft, who's only going to serve one term, um, breaks up 90 trusts in four years. He just doesn't get the same notoriety that Teddy Roosevelt gets um, for breaking up the, mono uh, the monopolies. And overall, you know, Teddy Roosevelt feels that Taft should be doing more. So Teddy Roosevelt starts to take it upon himself to speak out against Taft. And this starts to split the Republican Party um, because Republicans want to support Teddy Roosevelt, those who are loyal to him. Others felt, hey, Taft's doing a good job. Yes, he's not as out there and in your face as Teddy Roosevelt, but he's still doing his job and doing it effectively. So this is going to be a problem for the Republican Party. Since Roosevelt was angry with Taft for being too cautious, he's going to take it upon himself to come out of retirement, essentially, of politics, and he's going to try to run for a third term. So in 1912, he's going to try to become the Republican candidate. Unfortunately, there were people in the Republican Party who did not want to put Teddy Roosevelt on the ballot. They wanted to continue with William Taft. So Roosevelt says, fine, if I'm not going to get the Republican nomination, I'll make my own party. And so he creates what is known as the Progressive Party. And it, get, it gets nicknamed the Bull Moose Party because he, you know, people are starting to question the age and health of Teddy Roosevelt. And was he you know, suitable to become president again? And he told a reporter, I'm as strong as a bull moose and ready for the fight. And so that became the nickname. And as you can see here on his button, kind of the slogan for his party is the Bull Moose Party. <clears throat> Some of the things on the Progressive Party's agenda called for the direct election of senators, so the 17th Amendment. He felt that all states should have the initiative, the referendum, and the recall. And he also was an advocate for women having the right to vote. So you can see he's trying to play into those subgroups of the progressive era. Um, he's trying to play up to the workmen that workers should have national workers' compensation, that they should have an eight-hour workday, that there should be a set minimum wage. Uh, for workers, particularly women. There should be you know, laws against child labor. So he's trying to address 
and hit all the targets of the progressive era with his progressive party. Unfortunately, this is going to split the Republican Party and it's going to make it an easy election for the Democratic Party. So the Democrats um, nominated Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was um, a professor at Princeton University. He was a great historian of American history and understanding of politics. He had a great agenda for domestic policy. His domestic policy was called the New Freedom. He demanded an even stronger antitrust legislation. He wanted to look at the financial side of the United States and wanted to reform banking and reduce the amount of tariffs when it came to international trade. The Republicans were split. You know, some Republicans are going to join and support the Progressive Party or the Bull Moose Party under Roosevelt's um, candidacy. Others are going to stay loyal to William Howard Taft. Um, a fourth candidate is going to be the Socialists. Okay, so the Socialist Party that is going to nominate Eugene B. Debs. So the Socialists, again, want to have more equal contributions of the government and equal wealth amongst American society, more government programs that are going to provide for the masses um, that's very different from the essence of capitalism. Because of the split between the Republican parties, this is a pretty much an easy election for the Democrats to win. And Woodrow Wilson and his new freedom will start to take power um, in, in the election of 1912. <clears throat> So under this, he wanted to attack what he considered the triple wall of a privilege. He felt trusts were privileged that kept the wealthy wealthy um, and did not give equal distribution of resources to the American public. He felt tariffs also protected industrialists and also the high finance, the banking industries catered to those industrialists and not to the everyday citizen. So that's why those are the three areas that he wanted to tackle. The Sherman Antitrust Act proved to be too weak against the monopolies, and so we will see new antitrust legislation with the Clayton Antitrust Act. And it was just simply to strengthen the Sherman Antitrust Act and their ability to break up those trusts. Wilson's other reforms to the economy came in the form of the federal income tax. So this is the uh, 16th Amendment that is going to get passed, which will allow the federal government to tax um, people's wages. So they will bring in those taxes. And again, those taxes are in turn going to the masses in forms of public services to try to provide for as many as possible. He also establishes the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. So this is where he's going to try to regulate the banking industry um, and make the banking industry more accessible to the average American citizen. So he's going to divide the nation into 12 districts and establish a regional or central bank that all smaller banks must answer to. So the Federal Reserve is going to be the one who sets the interest rates, who also monitors the flow of currency. It's essentially the bankers' banks, okay, that the banks have to answer to. So if banks need to order money, they can't just get it directly from the government. They have to go through the Federal Reserve. Um, the Federal Reserve will set the interest rates, so what banks can charge on loans. It's not just up to the will of the bank owner themselves. So this is trying to bring some um, cohesion to the banking industry across the United States. And so the Federal Reserve System still exists today. Now, under Woodrow Wilson's presidency, there is going to be some limitations to how far progressives are going to go. And the limitations are going to stop in the role of civil rights. Um, Woodrow Wilson was from Virginia. He was born and raised in Stanton, Virginia, and he um, is going to embrace the concepts of segregation. Um, Wilson's new freedom got a lot of winning support from African Americans. They thought that Woodrow Wilson would address the um, issues of segregation and Jim Crow laws that were spreading rampant through the United States at this time. Unfortunately, though, for many African Americans, uh, Wilson opposed federal anti-lynching legislation. He felt that anti-lynching laws should be a power reserved to the states, not at a national level. A national level. He also uh, supported legislation that supported um, segregation. So prior to his presidency, uh, the District of Columbia, or D.C., was not segregated. They did not have segregation laws or Jim Crow laws. There was equal opportunity and equal access to resources. Under Wilson's administration, we will see segregation laws start to be established in D.C. 
And so, for example, the Capitol building will have segregated water fountains and segregated restrooms um, and segregated access to certain components of government buildings. And there, we can still see remnants of that today. You can go through the Capitol building um, before renovation and you could see where they just painted over doors that had said white only um, or colored only. So, you know, he brought segregation to the nation's capital. And this is going to provoke some movements amongst African Americans as well. Um, you know, with the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson that established the concept of separate but equal. Um, and segregation laws in 1896, we have some early civil rights leaders. When people think of civil rights, they think of Martin Luther King, they think of Rosa Parks or maybe Malcolm X or the Black Panthers. But there were earlier civil rights leaders that did not take segregation laws lightly. One such person was Booker T. Washington. Now, Booker T. Washington had a humble beginning. He was born a slave um, in the state of Virginia. However, upon uh, the 13th Amendment being passed, he is going to move and he is going to get an education and he actually ended up graduating from Hampton Institute and eventually he himself is going to find his, um, found his own institution of higher learning for African Americans called Tuskegee Institute. He truly believed that African Americans would achieve equality through the economy. If African Americans proved to be a vital asset to the economy as workers, um, that equality would come from that. Another civil rights leader was W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, he was of French and African descent. He had never been a slave. He came from a relatively wealthy African American family from up north. He was well educated. He was the first African American to receive his doctorate from um, Harvard University. So he has a very different upbringing. He never experienced um, discrimination or segregation until the Jim Crow era, which is gonna heavily influence his thought process and ideology. So as I mentioned, Washington felt that African Americans should gradually push for equality. They should not demand equality right away. Um, he felt the most important thing was to learn a skill set. So again, becoming an active member of the economy would eventually bring about full racial equality in other areas of life. Um, and this a lot has to do with his background, the fact that he had once been a slave. Um, he knew what it was like to have no rights at all. So even though he may not have full rights at this point, it's still better than slavery. Where Du Bois felt things being taken from him. Um, he did not accept the gradual approach. He thought that this made African Americans second class citizens, that they shouldn't just get a skill and a job or a trade, that they should get higher education, that they should become their own business owners or they should become doctors or lawyers, um, that they should demand equality right away. And you know, for him, experiencing Jim Crow laws, he felt the severity of things being taken from him, freedoms and mobility being taken from him, where a lot of former slaves didn't feel that same extreme. Because it, again, even with limited rights to them, it was better than the institution of slavery. And so Du Bois is going to found, or be one of the founding members of the NAACP, the National um, Association for the Advancement of Color People. And he's going to become very vocal. And he's quite critical of Booker T. Washington. But over time, he starts to understand that Du Bois' situation, his situation, um, was not the common situation for most African Americans, that more African Americans had more in common with Washington. And he started to understand their perspective a little bit more. So it's important to note that the progressive era is going to try to address a lot of problems and issues in American society, but it's not going to be able to solve everything.